Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to the 18th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from our colleague, Morris Golden. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item five in private. Are we agreed? We are agreed. The second item of business on our agenda today is to hear evidence on the Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill from a panel of stakeholders. Uh, let me welcome Melissa Donald, the Scottish Branch President of the BVA, Mike Flynn, the Chief Superintendent of the Scottish SSPCA, um, Nicola O'Brien, Campaigns Director for Captive Animals Protection Society, and Liz Tyson, the Consultant with Born Free Foundation. Uh, members have a series of uh, questions to put to you. It may be that other matters that arise from the evidence may require you to get back to us in writing, so hopefully you'll bear that in mind, and thank you for your cooperation. Um, I'm going to ask Emma Harper to kick things off. Emma Harper. Good morning, panel. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around welfare versus ethics as, as we propose this ban for wild animals and circuses. I'm wondering what the panel's um, thoughts are about the advantages and disadvantages of pursuing a ban on ethical rather than welfare grounds, and what would the panel's views be on the three criteria that are used to propose the ban, which are impact on respect for animals, impact on travelling environments on the animal's nature, and ethical costs versus benefits? And what would be your views on how clear the purpose and policy objective of the bill is? Okay, who wants to go first? <laughs> um, so from the Born Free Foundation, I think our perspective has been equally with the um, policy process in England as well, that actually a ban could have been introduced under welfare grounds. Um, that said, I don't, we don't believe that the two concepts are mutually exclusive, so we think that ethics and welfare necessarily are they're inextricably linked. The, our concern for welfare is inevitably going to be either based on or informed by <coughs> ethical decisions. Um, I saw in one of the previous sessions that one of the questions um, raised was about how, how transport fits into this ethical bracket, because surely that is more focused on welfare rather than ethics. Um, but again, I mean, I think when we're talking about respect for wild animals from an ethical perspective, when we're talking about respecting their natural needs and their natural behaviours, then I think it fits perfectly that we would say it wouldn't be ethical to, trans to transport lions, tigers, elephants in the back of lorries because it frustrates their ability to do that. So while I think as an organisation we would have liked to see a ban brought in on welfare grounds partly because we'd like to see that aspect of um, the Animal Welfare, Health and Welfare Bill or Act tested um, to be able to fulfil that, then we're happy, really, that the a ban is proposed to be introduced in the most expedient way possible. And if that's via an ethical grounds, we certainly agree that respect for animals, etc., etc., are all really important. Um, I can only... Um, I first got involved in this uh, way back in 2007 when there was a Westminster committee set up um, who refused to take basically anecdotal evidence on the welfare aspect. Um, so that's why the kind of ethical as aspect came in. Um, from my point of view, I've always thought that anim wild animals and travelling circuses should be banned, and I, I could quite happily say on welfare grounds. Um, from the ethical point of view, it is a bit of a no-brainer from my point. Um, there is no real benefit other than entertainment for having certain species in circuses. Can I ask, does it actually matter the grounds for banning this? Is it just the fact that we need to get a ban? Um, I think so. From, you know, CAPS have worked on this issue for 60 years now, and from our interactions with the public, it, it is a mixture where the, people think that the inherent nature of travelling, of the training, of making those animals perform, they feel that that's a welfare concern. But I agree with Liz's comment that it is so linked to ethics because people have this feeling that it's wrong to do that. And that may stem from the fact they think that it compromises the welfare of the individuals. But I think it's, as the uh, government themselves have pointed out in your um, 
a policy document that it is this growing um, opinion of public about how we see animals. And I think that people just feel that they don't think it's right that we use animals in this way. So however that's delivered, um, I think it, it's, it's meeting the needs of uh, and those viewpoints of the public that's, that's a priority here. And of course, and for the animals themselves. Emma, do you want to come back in at this point? Yeah, I think um, last time we took evidence, they talked about the five freedoms for animals. So freedom from uh, hunger and thirst, pain and discomfort, um, injury, and freedom to express normal behaviour and freedom from fear and distress. So can animals that are in a circus environment experience f f uh, the freedom to express normal behaviours? I categorically no. Um, I mean, I think you might have um, freedom from, I think, injury and disease, potentially because there is the there's the potential for veterinary care. But in terms of natural behaviours, in terms of natural environment, in terms of social groupings, um, in terms of just having the ability to make choices about their day to day life, then I would say that no, they're they're severely frustrated, if not impossible to meet in some circumstances. Um, I think the incidences of stereotypic behaviours which we see in animals in circuses and in other facilities, so um, just to explain what those are, they're behaviours that we may see animals performing that are unusual, that don't serve any function and you normally wouldn't see in animals in the wild. Um, that may be a, a tiger pacing up and down sort of in a, in a small area back and forth or shaking their heads from side to side that is recognised as an indicator of the impact of captivity on animals and um, it is seen in, in wild animals and circuses as well and I think can show that they are being deprived of, of being able to perform the behaviours that they would perform uh, naturally, um, which of course if we're comparing the uh, environment of a, a circus and long hours of confinement to what that animal would have naturally in the wild, then you can see why it may not meet the needs that those animals have. Carson, do you want to come in? Ed, what's your, what's your thoughts on the, the penguin parade at Edinburgh Zoo or wild birds of prey uh, at agricultural shows, just on the basis of what you've said just now? So our organisation would also be opposed to those uh, the, using animals in those way because we feel that, again, we don't think it's... It, going through the, the three um, reasons that were set out for this bill, the impact on respect for animals, we don't think that it fulfills that. Um, we, again, you're teaching people that if you're kind of parading animals or displaying them in such a form of entertainment, that that would be inappropriate. Um, again, with falconries, you know, our organisation again, would oppose the use of animals in that way. We think there's lots of uh, similar ethical and welfare um, concerns with animals um, used in that way however we are aware that today we're here to talk about circuses in particular and that is the issue that the public have responded to um, with regards to the consultation Donald, do you want to come in on any of this yeah um, we don't um, we fully support this this bill as it is um, but the one thing in Edinburgh Zoo is they have a permanent enclosure and the bulk of the time they're able to exhibit more natural behaviours. At the end of the day, falcons and everything do need to be exercised and by flying. And one way the display is actually exercising them and teaching them to go and grab food. So, you know, it is a different matter from the transportation of this bill is the issue. Going back to, to your, your point earlier, um, Ms. Harper was was the the when the the name traveling circuses. The whole point is they're traveling, and so space is limited, and so you cannot you might have you know inappropriate species next to each other, which would induce fear as well. So that's a, a point I would like to make. Thank you. Okay, can, can we explore that at this point? Because your submission talks about the impact of group housing and possible aggression and abnormal behaviour. Could you expand on that for us? Um, when you only have a certain amount of room to transport things, the, 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 the point is that um, fear, what, you know, uh, one of the main, main, if you're scared, the first thing you do in a lot of species is to fight, you know, to appear bigger than they are. And so it's just to, to dominate the situation, to tell the other guy, hey, 
don't don't mess with me, even though inside they're, they're, they're very scared. Uh, and perhaps also on a point of clarity at this point, on page six of your submission, you say the ban should cover, and I quote, we believe that this ban should cover all uh, wild animal species without exception. Um, how does that differ from what's proposed? To be clear, it's bullet point seven in your submission. Just so there's no loopholes, to, so that people can then argue um, that this isn't a wild animal. So it's just so it's really clear. And how would you propose that's done? Under the um, definitions that are, uh, are already there that you've got in the bill. Okay. And do you have you a fear over any specific possible loopholes as the, the bill's drafted? No, not not at this point. Not as it's drafted. No. Okay. Right. Anything else on this topic, Emma Harper? No, thank you. Right, OK, so we'll move on. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Yeah, thanks for being here. Can I get the panel's views on the general scope of the bill? So the bill doesn't include static circuses. Um, it doesn't include the transportation uh, and keeping of animals in Scotland that are part of a, a travelling circus. Um, and it also doesn't cover other forms of animal performance, and you've touched on those already. Um, so can I get your views on the scope of the bill as drafted? As I said earlier, it's quite historic, the, the reason this came about. When it first was mooted a um, decade and a half ago, England and Wales was talking about a total ban on circuses. And at that point, one of the most famous circuses who was based their winter quarters in Blackpool was trying to buy a site in Kilmarnock to relocate. Uh, and there's a kind of parallel between this this bill and the mink bill that came in in 2001 or whatever. Um, we didn't have any mink farms, but it was being proposed to be banned down south, so we implemented a ban up here so that they couldn't relocate. Um, so the, the actual context of the bill is, has not really changed going back uh, 15 years. It's, I see this as a preventative measure. I mean, I've got to hope the committee understand the, the way circuses have changed over the years. I mean, I've been in this job 30 years, and before that, I was a keeper at Edinburgh Zoo for seven years. And all the penguins, and back to your question, sir, um, the penguins are free to come and go on the parade. Nothing's forced to go out. Um, so 30 years ago, we had about six travelling circuses coming to Scotland. We had elephants, tigers, lions, um, the eel Flaraggio circus had giraffes, hippos, uh, etc. That's diminished over the years. I don't believe there is any circuses based in Britain now that have got any large cats. Um, the last of them went away a couple of years ago. We know the story of uh, Annie the Elephant, and that was the last elephant that was used in captivity. People aren't clamouring to see these performances now. Circuses aren't adding these animals to their collections to try and get people in. So the whole perception has changed in the last 15, 20 years. If, it, if it's preventative, then why not add in static circuses as well so that they, they might not appear? <laughs> Um, pass. I don't know, but you've got a better. You do have a better chance of ensuring some better uh, conditions for animals in static circuses because you're taking out the travelling aspect. I mean, if any of you have we visited every circus that has come here in the last 30 years, and some of the accommodation for them is what you would class as suitable uh, for it actually to be housed and sleep in. But there's no way it can exhibit any kind of natural behaviour in that aspect. Yeah, some other views. Um, with regard to comments on static circuses, we have outlined that we feel that they could be included. Um, again, coming back to our work, we uh, interact with the public on this issue all the time. It's a huge part of our work is to engage with the public, to get their opinions and to hopefully to uh, raise awareness on the issue. And people's concerns are that animals are being used in a circus to perform and in, in the environment that a circus is. The travel aspect is a large part of that, undoubtedly, and um, it is a one of the main arguments that we use about why we feel circuses with animals should be banned. But we, the, again, coming back to the ethical basis with impact on respect for animals and the, the third um, point of ethical cost versus benefits, putting those animals um, on display and making them perform behaviours in a static circus, if, it's, if we're talking about circuses here in the same way that we're talking about a travelling circus, a static circus, fundamentally using <coughs> animals in that way is what people have the concern with. So I don't see why, you know, aware that currently um, there aren't any static circuses in Scotland, but there's also 
uh, very few or none that are coming traveling to Scotland at present. So, um, you know, we would, would like to open up that maybe the inclusion of static circuses would be an option. Do you have evidence of wider public concern about animal performances beyond travelling circuses? Because the consultation was very much about travelling circuses. Yeah, yeah. Which I'm we struggling to know what is public opinion out there. Yes, I mean, um, in terms of <coughs> other consultations similar to that or polls that haven't been carried out, to my knowledge, that have asked specifically about that, um, I am going off the um, sort of the, the history of our organisation, other organisations, and also um, working with local people. So there are um, council bans, as, I'm, as you're aware, within Scotland and elsewhere the country um, on the use of animals in circuses. So we have engaged a lot with the public. They have supported that. They have rallied for that. And um, in the conversations that we have, it's not about one type of circus over another. It's using animals in circuses. That is the concern. Okay. Other views? Uh, if I can just add to that. Um, I think also just watching this or being part of this sort of advocacy and campaigning process both here and in England and also to a lesser extent in Ireland over the last seven or eight years. I also wonder whether the reason that static circuses haven't formed part of it was because everything started on the basis of um, looking into banning on welfare grounds, England then sort of inviting Scotland, um, rejecting the idea of banning on welfare grounds and going for ethics. Now, when it was being considered purely on welfare grounds, then obviously travelling was a huge part of it. And I think that it's almost sort of a, a, um, a kind of layover from that, that we still have the travelling part. But really, if we're being honest and we're talking about ethics, then I agree with what Nicola's saying, that actually if we're saying it's unethical to use wild animals in circuses, then obviously the travelling may impact that, but the, the wider issue really should be that they shouldn't be used. Mm -hmm. That said, again, just coming back to what we said before, we're really grateful that um, Scotland is, is hopefully moving forward on this. And so we understand that, again, the consultation has been carried out with that in mind. But I guess for me, that would perhaps give a, an explanation as to why static circuses have been left out. I would like to add is that um, in the static um, circuses, the housing and environment is more permanent and can be better adapted to cater to their welfare near. And as the others have said, the consultation highlighted the travelling was the main issue. And just finally, Kavina, um, Cabinet Secretary uh, has put it to us that the government intends to legislate on other areas of, of animal performance, uh, but it's not included, as we've just discussed, within the scope of this bill. Um, one of the local authorities last week said it might be better to have a, a catch-all approach rather than a piecemeal approach. But what, what's your view on that? Um, a approach in the sense of... Because I know there's discussion um, of potentially... Wider, the, the scope of the bill... It was put to us, I think, that the scope of the bill could also include all the other areas of animal, animal performance. I'm interested in your views on this um, specific targeted uh, approach to circuses rather than a wider approach. I, uh, it's a difficult one. If it, in an ideal world, I would love to say, as an organisation, I mean, Born Free, um, what we do is work to, um, I guess, campaign for, to protect, and also to oppose the use of wild animals in captivity. So from a, in an ideal world... We would love to see all of these things dealt with. Equally, we're very aware of the practicalities of it. Um, we were heartened in a meeting um, with um, civil servants, which we attended along with a number of other um, panellists here, to say that, you know, the issue of mobile zoos, the issues of reindeer displays, etc., may be looked into soon, and we certainly welcome that. What I would be reluctant to say is that that should be considered now because I imagine it would be a huge amount of work, it would cause a huge delay, and we'd potentially miss the opportunity to just get this ban in, which um, we still think is incredibly important. So um, in an ideal world, not a piecemeal approach, but in a practical world, I think we would rather see this bill come in um, and then continue to work with the government to proceed on other issues. Okay. We have included comments in our submission about mobile zoos um, and similar uses of animals. Again, going back to the ethics, that's what we're talking about today, is that we feel that on all grounds, um, using animals in mobile zoos um, is the same. We think they've got very similar welfare um, 
considerations, if not the same. And we know that there's the report that's been mentioned. Which expanded the remit from just looking at animals in travelling circuses to um, other forms of travelling and uh, entertainment with animals, which included mobile zoos and came to the same conclusion that there were grounds for a ban on uh, animal welfare grounds for those as well. We support that. Um, again, I think we share the, the feelings with Liz there of, it, of being um, sort of torn where our organisation would and does. Uh, campaign for an end completely to the use of animals in that way um, and think but then on the other hand wanting this to move swiftly so that we can get this um, bill in given that we feel it's uh, grossly overdue for a bill of this nature to come into effect anywhere in the UK and think with Scotland leading on this would be a fantastic um, and significant start on that um, on this issue. Okay. Any other views? It, it may be down to public perception. I mean, the, the vast majority of the surveys that have been done that I've seen uh, are against wild animals and travelling circuses. There is a growth in bird of prey demonstrations. There is a, a current growth in what is classed as mobile zoos. I call them more uh, kind of mobile exhibits because it's not a zoo as such. They're not taking tigers and lions about. Um, but anyone here could hire for their children's party or their school eight to hundred pounds. You pick the species you want, which is mainly snakes, small mammals, uh, and uh, spiders, etc. So these are all travelled, and we've had some concern in the past that snakes are being travelled alongside ferrets, alongside other things. Uh, so there is a, we do have a concern about that. But I think that is kind of down the pecking line towards the circus aspect. I think that we would say that the. Given the history, the public opinion, the work that's already been done on circuses, that that would be the priority. But we included it because we want to strongly point out that we think that it, it needs to be taken just as seriously, probably in due course after the, the passing of this bill, given the, I mean, just a, a small highlight there of, of the issues. Um, you know, we've got the, the travelling aspects, the being travelled in, many of these animals are put in small crates or boxes. We've um, found mobile zoos where there are social animals being kept singly, they're out on the road for many hours at a time, they're then at the events for many hours at a time, there's the handling aspect, which um, maybe even goes beyond circuses because these animals are being passed around, they're being handled by children, by adults. There's, we feel like there's a, there's a whole catalogue. And, and this is a relatively new industry. So, you know, of course, it is only just becoming the attention of authorities like, like local authorities and at government level and, and even uh, NGOs and animal welfare groups. Um, but we wanted to include that given that we think it is certainly worth the same amount of consideration in future. Counter argument that says that properly run um, displays of this type encourage respect for animals. It certainly encourages a greater understanding of them. So, is there not a balance to be struck here? I think that's an argument that's been used about circuses in the past. Um, yeah, as I say, our organisation's worked on this for 60 years, not me personally, but um, reading back um, in, on the campaign and the sort of arguments that have been put forward for circuses in the past have been very similar, that it was a way that people could view and get close to wild animals in a way they wouldn't have had before um, and to learn something about them potentially. But I think that, as we've already pointed out, um, as, uh, as a nation, we, our anim attitudes towards animals are changing and there are ways that we can uh, achieve res uh, knowledge and respect for animals without having to have them live in front of us to handle and have our photos taken with. Richard Lyle. Yeah. Thank you, you know, can I remind members that I am the convener of the Cross Party Group for the Showman's Guild and an honorary member of the Showman's Guild Scottish section and I actually support the principles of this bill, but I do have some concerns. Martin Burton, representing the Association of Circus Proprietors of Great Britain, stated his concerns last week at lack of clarity regarding the definitions of the bill. He said, clearly the economic impact on circuses with wild animals that already do not come to Scotland will be zero. However, the economic impact on animal displays in shopping centres, as my colleague Finlay Carson asked earlier, uh, in regard to penguins on 
hawks, wild bird, uh, bird displays, outdoor shows, Santa displays, use of reindeer, and eventually on zoos will be massive. That is the direction the legislation is going. It will eventually close your zoos, basically, which uh, Nicola O'Brien was alluding to a few minutes ago. Um, do the panel... Do the panel agree that the bill relates to travelling circuses and therefore does not cover static circuses, zoos? Do you believe that it, cover, that it covers uh, other animal shows, Wild West shows, or any show with a different theme, or does it need to be tightened as per the cab sex recent letter? From the definitions point of view, we do have um, we we had a concern about the definition of domesticated animals, but not about the definition of circus. And I think one of the things that is is often thrown up when we're talking about um, when we've had the same thing in different countries, where this idea of of this legislation or something of its sort being the thin end of the wedge, and then the floodgates will open and suddenly you're not allowed to have a pet dog or a pet cat. Um, I mean that would. You know, in terms of if if we could impact animal welfare in zoos, if we could impact animal welfare in other situations, we'd be very happy. But we're also very aware that legislation is very tightly and narrowly focused. I think this one is. We have, um, for years, since 1981, we've had circuses excluded from zoo licensing, and it's worked perfectly. The... Um, uh, the licensing regime in the UK is specifically for circuses. We haven't had falconry shows um, kind of accidentally captured, and that has exactly the same definition. A travelling circus is a circus which effectively travels. People know what a circus is. They're not going to confuse it with a falconry show in a shopping centre or a, or a mobile zoo because the legislation and the precedent already shows that that has never happened. Um, and certainly it's not the case anybody involved in advocacy and lobbying to introduce animal welfare legislation will know that introducing one certainly doesn't open the floodgates to suddenly fix everything else at all. Uh, CAPS have expressed concerns about the definition of uh, circus, haven't you? Yes, we have. Um, in that, we understand that it's been stated that there's no need to specifically outline, given that there is a general understanding of what circus means um we do we welcome that we're not sort of saying that it definitely needs to be defined but we we're welcoming welcoming it with caution given that we don't want um some business some businesses that we would think would be classed as circuses to be excluded um i think that really the decision on the definition needs to come from from government to for what you feel that you, it is that you're wanting to ban but um i think that we and the other NGOs probably present would be happy to help define on that if that's what is deemed necessary. So give us an example of the type of business you think could get through a loophole here. Um, I think there have been some comments on this in, in previous sessions as well, um, that there may be, uh, for example, a, an act that has travelled with big cats and they may say that they don't subscribe to being classed as a circus um, because they don't have some of the more traditional aspects of a circus or what may uh, the image of a circus that conjures in the mind um, of the general public. Um, so they may argue that whether that means that it, uh, when it came to actually being covered by the bill, you know, it would be agreed, OK, they wouldn't be covered. That would be left, I think, open. So that's our concern. Um, but we don't also want to narrow the focus too much so that then it may end up in the same issue. Is that clear? Richard. Yeah, I representing an evening with lions and tigers, uh, <coughs> basically said that he was out with the scope of the bill. And can I come back to... When we go to councils, we've got 32 councils in Scotland who work the 1982 Act, uh, Civic Government Scotland Act, but basically uh, a lot of them interpret the Act differently. And it was basically suggested by Andrew Mitchell of Edinburgh Council that if the government want to improve this, how we deal with it, we better do it in one piece of legislation and that a piecemeal approach is not helpful. And basically his colleague from... Uh, Argyll and Butte agreed with them. So what's your view on the Council's um, interpretation of the Act? I understand. So the Council are asking for um, other types of animal uh, use to be brought in under this same bill? They're looking for clarification. The circuses part of the bill 
to them was, as I say, you know, I refer to and Anthony Beckworth, who, who sought clarification from someone in the Scottish Government, uh, and they said, I don't know. Well, I mean, I think it, it has its circus has existed. So, for example, um, any travelling circus has known since the introduction of the Zoo Licensing Act that they weren't a zoo. So they knew well enough to define themselves as a circus so that they're not, so that they don't fall under those licensing regimes. And the evening with lions and tigers certainly defined itself as a circus when it was in England because they applied for a licence and were refused. So... I guess, it, yes, of course, it could be that um, the local authorities say, well, we don't know exactly how to define it, but actually that, that wriggle room is given in so much legislation and it allows so that we don't end up with absurd situations where something which clearly isn't a circus becomes one. So while, uh, I guess, as, as Nicola said, we want to make sure all circuses are captured, um, I think common sense would say that somebody performing in a big top with a group of lions and tigers would be defined as a travelling circus, and that was certainly how they defined themselves in England. Well, a travelling circus is basically with uh, clowns, acrobats, if you go to the definition of, of circus. And, and this is the grey area mm -hmm. that, that I'm concerned about. I support the bill, mm -hmm. I think, you know, I, I certainly... But uh, it's been pointed out there's, you know, there, there hasn't been a wild animal travelling in a circus in Scotland for a number of years, I think. Mike Flynn said that, and the, what was basically said last week is to hop, they go, they go 27 miles, but more than that would affect the, the animals, and, and basically I think Melissa agrees with me, with Melissa Donald, um, so the, the very little, but again, I, I know the government wants to ensure that they um, stop this, but I, I'm actually getting some research done just now, of the 32 councils, but most of them already have banned uh, wild animals and circuses on council land. Um, but just to finish off, to what extent could the definition of wild animal pose an interpretational challenge to this bill? I think that less the term wild animal poses a problem, but I think it's the inclusion of the definition of domesticated animal. I think the two are obviously mutually exclusive, but I think the way in which the term domestication or domesticated animal has been um, defined is confusing, and it could suggest that simply breeding animals in a captive environment for a few generations and taming them, which is very, very different to the process of domestication, which takes place over millennia and, and changes animals genetically, physically, um, physiologically, then I think that could become confusing. And I think that could lend itself to arguments which I've heard before, which um, we certainly wouldn't subscribe to. And it'd be certainly interesting to hear the vet's opinion that, um, that an, a tiger bred for five generations in a circus is now domesticated, with that absolutely against any scientific information we have. Um, but our suggestion is simply to remove it because actually the wild animal def definition of an animal not normally domesticated in the British Islands um, has been used successfully in the um, Zoo Licensing Act since the early 1980s. And there is no definition of a domesticated animal and yet that, that um, definition has served perfectly well. So our suggestion is simply to remove the reference to domesticated animals because it may become confusing. And on this in particular because um, from your background in enforcement and investigation, how do you view the definitions in the bill? Would you be co uh, comfortable with them? Yes, I would. Um, the fact it's commonly domesticated in the UK takes out things like camels, etc., which some people will argue have been basically domesticated in other countries in the world. So that's that covered. Circus is a widely uh, known term. Um, I don't totally agree that a circus has to have every aspect of what some people think because you've got the Chinese and the Russian state circuses coming here. They've got no animals. They never have had animals. So that's still classed as a circus. Um, so I don't really have any problem with the definitions. And ultimately, when it comes to this kind of thing, it's the court that decides. Um, and there's lots of things that we deal with that hasn't got clear definitions. Puppy, puppy farms is one. There isn't a clear definition in the eyes of the law on a puppy farm, but we can deal with that. So I don't really see there's a problem there. Where you do have a problem is 32 different local authorities having 32 different opinions. Um, now, that comes across to the licensing sector everywhere because you can pay 
You want a dangerous wild animal licence in Glasgow, cost you 50 quid. If you want one in Edinburgh, they'll just price you out of the market. You can't possibly do it. So there is no um, common ground there. And it's great that um, local authorities have banned circuses um, appearing on their land. But historically, when that first came in in Edinburgh, they went to Murrayfield Ice Rink Car Park, they went to the Highland, uh, Royal Highland Showground. If, if there's a loophole there, they will find it. So I don't have a problem with the definitions. I also want to come back to Mr Lyle's questions. OK, you content with that, Mr Lyle? Yeah, can I just... A wee quick one. Domesticated animal, what's a, a llama, a camel or a reindeer? A, a llama in this country is now um, classed as domesticated. There's a very, there's been very clear guidance off the back of the, off the back of the Zoo Licensing Act because there's had to be um, for some time, and there's a schedule which helps um, local authorities to understand what is and isn't. I know some um, species of reindeer are considered domesticated in some places and not elsewhere. I couldn't give you the exact species and subspecies names, but again, that has existed in those schedules. A camel is never domesticated currently in the British Isles. Um, and so, yeah, that, that already exists. There's precedent in on the UK statute book. Thank you, can you do that? Thank you. Well, let's move on. Uh, Dave Stewart. Uh, thank you. Good morning, panel. Um, how effective is the UK government's licensing system at safeguarding the welfare of wild animals in travelling circuses? I'd like to kick off with that. Material effect. Um, the, things haven't changed over the years, so I've got really no comment to make on that. The, the travelling aspect has always been the biggest concern that we've had. Um, I, I agree with uh, what Mr Lyle says, that normally circuses these days will go 20 miles, 15 miles, whatever. But in the livestock industry, it's commonly known the biggest problem with transporting animals is the loading and unloading. So again, even if it's a short distance, you've still got an element of stress there. Um, livestock can be easily physically handled. You cannot easily physically handle tigers and lions. Anyone else, Liz? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to add to that, so... Um, Peter Jolly's circus, which is one of the two, um, one of the two circuses which currently has wild animals, um, performed with the what is now the Evening with the Lions and Tigers Act for a number of years. Um, that act was licensed as part of Jolly's circus for I think two years, um, and then kind of broke off, came up here to Scotland, was in Fraserburgh over um, over winter. I think the first weakness that that shows is that they, he could literally take his animals out of the licensing regime. Put them across the border and suddenly there were no um, meaningful regulations beyond sort of general animal welfare and I think one of the very telling things after that was then when uh, Mr Chipperfield and Mr Beckworth attempted to apply for a circus license and my understanding is using the same lorries the same um, accommodation they were refused because it didn't meet standards so what appears to have happened is that the same accommodation the same standards had been licensed for two years and then suddenly they weren't. So I think there's discrepancies about how, how is this being inspected? Um, and also, so for example, Circus Mondeo also had its license suspended after numerous warnings from which are documented from DEFRA. So mm -hmm. allowing members of the public to have contact with the reindeer when they're in winter quarters. There were issues surrounding um, the welfare of one of the camels, as I understand it. And it repeated warnings eventually <clears throat> that resulted <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> in um, the circus license being suspended and there were um, sort of all sorts of issues with getting the paperwork together and things like that it doesn't look to us from the outside that it's done anything substantial to improve animal welfare but to be honest that doesn't really surprise us because that's what I think uh, all the organisations who consulted, or actually we refused to consult on this particular measure, but all of the organisations who've been involved in this just looked at it from the outset and said this isn't going to work. As you, um, as you know, the Scottish Government rejected the regulatory approach and one of the arguments was the lack of scientific data on animal welfare. Would you agree with that assessment? Um, I think one of the things, yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a claim made by um, the Westminster government when they introduced the licensing regime was that this would, and I think it would almost word for word, this would guarantee that high standards of welfare was met. When we then questioned the Westminster government and said, well, what sort of analysis and what research mm. have you done to explore how to meet welfare needs of wild animals in circuses? They confirmed that they hadn't done any. So it 
from our view, it appeared to be based on kind of setting the benchmark at the point of kind of the, the best circus standards you could get, but whether or not those standards ever met animal welfare needs were never confirmed, and we would argue very strongly that they, they, mm. they couldn't. Mm. So there was a real issue with the data and with enforcement as yep. well. Yes, I think that's very helpful. Do any that. of the other panel members have any observations on that? I think Mike Flynn's already commented. Just cover the examples that I had um, with regard to Circus Mondeo. Um, our only general comment on it is that licensing and continuing the allowance of, of wild animals in travelling circus doesn't address the ethical concerns, which is obviously mm -hmm. um, what this is based on. So. You, you've already touched on, I suppose in some ways, your ideal bill to answers to my colleagues uh, earlier on. But I mean, if you were starting from scratch and you were wishing to protect wild animals in travelling circuses, would there be other aspects that you would add to a, a bill that doesn't appear, or would you basically uh, wish to endorse the, the government bill? Is there, is there anything you would take away, or is there anything you would add on? Um, from our perspective, I think the only, the only thing that we would um, sort of substantive is to remove the domestication um, definition for the reasons outlined. Um, we understand, I guess, that you know it's it's about display, it's about performance, and it's about exhibition because um, banning ownership then goes into completely different territory, which would be arguably discriminatory. So, um, as far as we're concerned, as the bill stands in terms of of banning wild animals in travelling circuses, which is something we've all worked towards for a long time, we would support it as it as it stands to go through with the suggestion that the domestication um, definition is taken out. Thank you. Nicola, would you? Yeah, in agreement. If, with a focus on wild animals in travelling circuses, the, um, again, we highlighted our concern over the domestic, um, domesticated definition, believing it could be open to challenge. Um, so with a focus on wild animals, we would happy with this bill. Mike Flynn. Mm. I think I said in my submission, um, I, I see this as a preventative measure. The circus community, and I've, I've known every one of them that's come to Scotland in 30 years, are very law-abiding. Nobody's going to um, break the law once they know they're not supposed to do it here. And given that um, Martin um, reported last week this has got to have no financial impact on the industry as it stands, I, I really don't have a problem with it, because it, that's not what the intention is. The intention is just to, to stop it before it starts. Was it all? Yeah, the BVA supports this proposed bill as it is. No actual additions or... Anything else? Right, that's very straightforward. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, Kate Forbes. But, um, I'd like to ask some questions about the enforceability of the legislation. And the question is whether you think that there are implications of um, it being an ethical rather than a welfare basis for the bill on the enforceability. We had a comment from. Um, if my laptop moves fast enough, from David Kerr of Argyll and Beat Council, who said that moving things to an ethical basis could be very profitable for defence teams because what we need when we enforce legislation is a clear definition. Um, any thoughts on the enforceability on the basis of it being ethical rather than a welfare basis? I, I mean, Mike's probably way better to answer this, but just to put a, a small point forward then, because it's under, um, it's kind of strict liability if you operate with, if you operate a circus full stop, then you've breached the regulations. I don't see that the, the, the background, once it comes to enforcing, is going to impact that, it, regardless of whether it's on welfare grounds or not. If you're operating a circus, you're in breach of the legislation. That seems quite clear to me. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that was an issue, but Mike would probably know far better. I would agree with that because it is, although the, the bill is based on the ethical principles because previous uh, committees said there wasn't sufficient evidence to take on welfare, it's a black and white offence. Mm -hmm. If you are operating a travelling circus, it doesn't matter if it's ethical or welfare based, you're, you're committing the offence. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would agree with that. Okay, great. And then moving on to um, local authorities, do you have any thoughts on um, the proposed enforcement approach and provisions, in particular the discretionary nature of the obligation on local authorities to enforce the bill? That's something that uh, springs up throughout um, lots of pieces of legislation, the 2006 Animal uh, Health and Welfare Scotland. Uh, it's not the local authority shall enforce it, it's they may. Um, so that, that's a common thing across a lot of licensing aspects. Um, so that's not going to make any difference here compared to other legislation. 
One of the problems you've got, um, and I'm, I'm not sitting here banging Kozla's drum, is that local authorities are vastly underfunded. Um, and when it comes to licence and provisions, it costs money. I'm a big supporter that if any licensing thing there, it should be self-funding because local authorities are going to take money from other essential services to provide something that, in no disrespect to them, a lot of them are not trained to do. Um, they, they don't know half the species that they're dealing with. In terms of um, powers, though, so in the bill, I wonder if you have any thought of the, accepting the point about the needs for resourcing and um, the lack of any provision that would enable local authorities to prevent a circus operating while they investigate and report a matter to the procurator fiscal or obtain records from the operator. Um, it's, it's in the bill. They, they've got the right, without, with warrant, um, to enter it. The, appropriate premises to gain any information that would be sent to the Procurator Fiscal to establish if an offence had been committed. But as I say, I mean, in other things, <coughs> other legislation extends to seizing the animal that's involved. Nobody's going to be seizing uh, an exotic animal from a circus. So that's why I'm saying that the fact that the, it is a law-abiding community we're talking about, I don't foresee that happening. I suppose it is, it's local authorities being able to serve a notice to prevent the activity from going ahead whilst the investigation is ongoing? Technically, the, as soon as they took their action and decided that a report would be going to the fiscal, if the show then moved five miles down the road and started again, it would be a subsequent offence, a subsequent offence, a subsequent offence. Um, I, I just don't see circus people doing it. Claudia Beamish. Right, uh, thank you. And I'd just like to continue with that uh, line of questioning in relation to enforcement. And uh, do you have any views, any of the panel, on uh, the proposed maximum fine level, which is level five? And are you confident that this level of maximum fine will act as an appropriate deterrent to the use of wild animals in travelling circuses in Scotland? Um, the, I think Martin, uh, in his evidence last week, basically said if you find him 5,000, it put him out of business. I mean, circuses aren't like when I was a child. You couldn't get any circuses. They were mobbed. Um, there's, some of them have got very poor attendances these days, and they've got very high overheads. Um, so I think £5,000 is proportionate. And I think also it's worth adding that, um, as Mike said, once the, once the ban is in, then... I think that so generally if something is banned, then people do abide by it. Um, and I don't think the circus community and the circuses with wild animals will will try to get round it. I think it will be, I think, you know, they're not going to be happy about it, but then that will be it. It's not going to be, we don't have to worry about them trying to breach it or get around it in some way, or certainly, that's, that's certainly not my view anyway. Any other comments on that from the panel? All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, that really concludes this uh, evidence session. Um, can I thank um, the panel for their contribution this morning? It's been very useful. Um, we are, as a committee, slightly ahead of schedule, so I am proposing that we move into private now and take item five, and then we'll resume at 11 o'clock when the Cabinet Secretary joins us um, for the next part of the public meeting. Is that agreeable to members? Okay, so we will now move into private. Thank you. And I ask that the gallery be cleared.
Uh, welcome back to the public part of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The committee will now take evidence on the prohibited procedures on protected animals exemptions Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 draft. We are joined this morning by Rosanna Cunningham, Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, Andrew Voss, uh, Veterinary Advisor, and Judith Brown, Solicitor. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to make a short opening statement on the draft um, regulations? Thank you, uh, Convener, and good morning to everybody. The draft regulations before you uh, and effectively would amend 2010 regulations to include an exemption for tail shortening in some limited circumstances. Uh, I think you've heard research commission from the University of Glasgow recorded that around one seventh of working dogs surveyed in the 2010-11 shooting season sustained at least one tail injury in that year with a higher incidence for certain breeds. The Scottish Government considers this research does provide sufficient evidence that shortening the tails of puppies at risk of tail injury while engaged in lawful shooting activities in later life will improve the welfare of those dogs. However, in line with the research findings, we do not intend that this should apply to all types of working dogs and require conditions to be met which aim to ensure that only those dogs at most risk are affected by the regulations. The proposed exemption therefore applies to the only two types of working dog, spaniels and hunt point retrievers, that are commonly, commonly used in these lawful activities. The evidence shows them to be at significantly higher risk of tail injury than other types. The evidence also showed that there was no benefit in reducing injury by removing more than the end third of the tail. For that reason, the draft regulations limit the extent by which a tail may be shortened to no more than the end third. The regulations also ensure, as far as is reasonably possible, that only those dogs likely to be used for lawful shooting purposes can have their tails shortened, and that veterinarians are the only persons who may carry out the procedure. The operating vet must therefore be satisfied that there has been produced to him or her evidence showing that the dog is likely to be used for working in later life. The draft regulations also provide that the procedure may only be carried out for the purpose of dog welfare. As required under the provisions in the 2006 Act, we did consult those considered to have an interest in tail shortening. In this case, a full public consultation on a tightly defined exemption took place between 10th February and 3rd May 2016. Of the total responses, 92% favoured permitting shortening and 52% considered shortening should be restricted to the end third of the tail. We are, of course, aware that whether or not to introduce this exemption remains a highly emotive issue. Ultimately, the proposed amendment will place the responsibility for making the decision in the hands of those who are, in my view, best placed to make an informed professional judgment. And these are the practicing veterinary surgeons, mostly in rural Scotland, who know the clients who are working dog breeders, understand the risks of injury associated with normal shooting activities, and most importantly, also have a professional duty to ensure the welfare of all animals in their care. We're happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Let, let me kick the questions off. The consultation document stated, this consultation concerns the case that has been made to us for the introduction of a tightly defined exemption regime. Could you outline for us, Cabinet Secretary, who made the case that the law should change and that docking should be allowed in certain limited circumstances, and what made that case persuasive? Um, well, of course, a lot of this took place before I was actually in post. Um, Mr Convener, I'll ask the Chief Veterinary uh, Advisor to, to give you some of the background to what led up to that. OK. Um, <clears throat> well, when uh, all tail docking in Scotland was banned back in 2007, there was a lot of concern raised by people who were interested in shooting gamekeepers, uh, members of Basque, that this would leave dogs involved in shooting at risk of injury. And there was a commitment at the time, given that if new evidence came to light about the risk of injury to dogs involved in shooting, then we would review the evidence in Scotland. There was, um, after 2007, there was the diesel study, in, which was published in 2010, which has been mentioned previously. Now, that looked at all types of dogs, so it wasn't focused on working breeds and it wasn't focused on working, actual working dogs in Scotland. And I think in that study, if I remember rightly, there were only 24 dogs involved in shooting activities identified in that study. At the time, there were a lot of dogs that were 
had traditionally been docked, so the population of dogs studied by diesel would include um, quite a high proportion of dogs that had already been traditionally docked. So for various reasons, that study didn't really give us the evidence that we needed that specifically applied to actual working dogs working in Scotland. And for that reason, we were then asked by the previous Cabinet Secretary, Mr Lockhead, to commission some research. So the research that we commissioned was the um, research you've heard about done at Glasgow University. And really that's where we are now, that we are now in a position to consider the results of that research and the arguments that we made around what that research shows. So the pressures really come from the people who have been closely involved in working dogs in Scotland and who believe there is a significant concern about injuries to the tails of undocked working dogs working currently in Scotland. Okay. Let's look further at that research. Mark Roscoe. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, <clears throat> we've had quite a lot of evidence about the limitations uh, of that research, so can I just run through some aspects of the limitations? Um, the diesel study that you referred to found out that a very significant aspect uh, related to tail injury was the kenneling arrangements. Did either of these studies look at kenneling? Um, <clears throat> well, as I said, the diesel study was looking at all types of dogs, including working breeds, non-working breeds, and they only had a f small number of what we would commonly understand to be working dogs involved in shooting. The purpose of the, um, as you've heard, there were, there were two main studies that came out of the Glasgow research, two main papers. One of those was looking at owner-reported injuries, and it was targeted intentionally at the community most likely to experience those injuries, which was the owners of working dogs in Scotland. So as a result, they were recruited from the Scottish gamekeepers and Basque and other people who were involved in shooting. Look at kenneling. Um, the, as you've said, the diesel study did look at kenneling. No, sorry, the, the two studies. The, the, Scottish the two studies, studies. Well, the... These two Scottish studies didn't specifically look at kenneling. The second study, looking at veterinary practice information, looked at whether animals had recorded tail injuries or not, so it didn't look at the cause of those injuries. Okay. Right, OK, thanks for that. Um, move on to another area, then. Um, impact of uh, tail docking in terms of behaviour and communication in dogs. Did either of these two studies commissioned by the Scottish Government look at the potential impact on these dogs uh, of tail shortening and their impact on in behaviour and communication? No, it wasn't uh, a specification right. for the study. No. OK. Well, why was that the case? Well, uh, <coughs> the intention was simply to uh, uh, get statistical information about the extent of tail injury, um, uh, the, the, the impact of uh, tail shortening um, uh, in respect of the interesting debate that I saw was being had around that um, wasn't the primary focus of that research. The research was an attempt to establish better information about what was being claimed in terms of tail injuries and the extent of it and whether or not that was borne out by actual facts. Yes, that's Looking at this. the contention was that, that you know, the, the propositions that have been put to us was that working dogs were exp experiencing more tail injuries because there were predominantly undocked, mm -hmm. and the purpose of the research was to investigate that specific yes. point that's been put to us. So I'm um, looking at this Cabinet Secretary from Animal Welfare point of view, uh, and we've had a lot of uh, research that's been submitted to the committee that implies um, strongly that there could be impact in terms of communication and behavioural difficulties in dogs with dock tails. So I'm asking why that wasn't considered, because clearly there could be a cost and a benefit um, to this uh, proposed exemption. Well, I, I mean, I didn't instruct the statistic, the, the, the research in the first place, so I, 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 I can't answer for the people who did. <coughs> um, uh, I suppose the purpose of the research was just to establish the extent of tail injuries um, and, to, and to operate on, on that basis. Um, I, I read with interest the discussions in the committee around this, and it didn't appear to me that, that from those discussions that there was conclusive evidence uh, either way, 
Uh, I accept that there is an interesting discussion to be had around that, but my view is that that is something that needs to be taken forward by veterinarians um, and to be uh, looked at in terms of how they would, uh, in certain cases, uh, manage pain if it was felt that pain was something that had to be managed. And I didn't, at this stage, get a sense that on a UK-wide basis, uh, the veterinary profession is actually at that point of that kind of discussion. Okay, so kenneling and behaviour hasn't been considered. Can I ask about um, the Ledra study? Um, this was a self-selecting study. It was advertised in country sports magazines. Do you see any inherent biases in that study? Well, I suppose, superficially, my, my first um, re reaction to that is uh, that this study was attempting to actually get information about dogs that were working. That the you know, previous studies, we've looked at studies on all dogs, uh, studies on working breeds, but of course, not all dogs in working breeds will actually be working, and that this was an attempt to get to those people who actually have dogs who are actually working um, and uh, uh, and that was what that was attempting to do um, I'm not sure and I'm not a statistician um, but I'm not sure how else easily it could have been done other than to reach out specifically to those who had those animals that were actually working could, could I ask I mean why the emphasis on a self-selecting group who've clearly got an interest in terms of preserving the tradition why why isn't this being led by veterinarians looking at their casework of working dogs and actually assessing what the impacts could be? Well, that was the purpose of the second study. So <clears throat> the original proposal was to have three studies. So there was the initial survey of the owners and users of working dogs. There was the survey of the veterinary practice data, which is known as the Cameron Report. So that was the second study that was published. And that teases out the information that was as far as we gather the information about injuries to dogs of working breeds um, on veterinary practice data. And the third study, which wasn't able to go ahead in the end, was designed to be, give the best quality evidence, which would have been a prospective cohort study where we would have identified a group of dogs that were going to be used for working over the next shooting season and monitored what happened to those dogs as the season progressed. So originally the research was set up with those three parts. Um, unfortunately, the third part wasn't achievable for various reasons, so we, we have to interpret the first two parts of this study as best we can. Uh, I mean, we had evidence at the uh, previous committee um, from a vet who, who, who does dock tails or would like to dock tails, um, that he'd seen only six tail injuries in the last year. Does that not conflict with the kind of figures that are coming out of the Ledra study, which would assume that all dogs at some point in their lives would have a tail injury that would need to be presented to a vet. Well, I suppose in reality um, you could run a study over a 10-year period because a working dog has a working life and the working life is more than one year. So, you know, you may see um, a dog with a tail injury or a small number of dogs with a tail injury in one year, but over a period of time that, would, that could likely be a lot higher. Um, uh, I, you know, that I, I might have been an interesting thing to have done, but it would have taken a very long time in which to do it, um, because you would really need to have tracked a cohort of dogs over, over their entire working lives. And it doesn't, I mean, none of these pieces of research have, 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 have done that over that very long period of time. But, but in those circumstances, if you track dogs over a long period of actual working lives, then I think the incidence of injury is likely to be considerably higher um, than, uh, uh, than at the moment. And we do have some evidence. And I asked, specifically asked a question about how, what percentage of dogs now are being imported from south of the border so that they can be assured of already being docked. And that is full docking compared to uh, uh, the dogs that are being worked with undocked tails. So I think there are, there are lots of issues in there. Um, and I, I know and from what the response I've got is that at the moment we are, it, it is a bit of a guesstimate in terms of those numbers. But 
they're fairly significant. So that will also be having an impact on the numbers because you can't, you're not then looking at those numbers in the context of working dogs who are undocked, if you see what I mean. Finally, can I, can I if that's, sure. before you do, I suppose the other great unknown in this is the number of injuries that are sustained that don't present at veterinary surgeons. We're, we're, we're being, yeah. uh, is there any feel for the kind of scale of that where perhaps the, the owners of the dogs are dealing with the injuries because they're relatively minor without ever presenting at a vet? Um, I, don't, I don't think well, that I, there I is, <clears throat> I, I mean, there is some evidence, although I, I need to remind people that dogs have a longish working life and that superficial or minor injuries in one year might become a more serious problem in subsequent years that you can't, that, you know, these are effectively a, a one year spot check look and dogs that have minor injuries in one year may go on to have more serious injuries later. Yeah, if I could maybe give you some figures. I know at the um, last hearing you were seeking to find some firm estimates of the number of working dogs in Scotland and how many might be brought in. So we've obviously had the Basque submission, which gives an estimate of maybe um, 50 thousand working dogs currently in Scotland. Now I've been having a look at some of the figures and trying to relate them to the information we have from the research that's been done. So if we assume from the Basque estimate of 50,000 working dogs, maybe 38,000 of those are Spaniels. Now from the Lederis study it was reported that maybe a third to a half of working spaniels are currently being imported from England, which most of those will be docked, either partial or full docks, as we've heard. And assuming that spaniels will live for 10 years on average, there will then need to be um, 3,800 puppies supplied every year to maintain that population of 38,000 spaniels. You, you follow me? Now, if, say, half, approximately half of those might be imported from England, so we're left with maybe 2,000 puppies per year being bred in Scotland to keep that constant population of spaniels in work. Now, looking at the statistics from the different studies, if we take those 2,000 puppies per year, according to the Ledra study, we might have 1,000 owner reported injuries and these will range from fairly minor nicks that can cause loss of blood to be spread everywhere they can look very unpleasant but there will be you know, relatively minor injuries to the more serious tail injuries of those um, thousand injuries there might be 333 that need veterinary treatment again from the information gathered in the letter report and of those 333 injuries, there might be 66 amputations. And this is based on the ratio of tail injuries to amputation, um, which is approximately five to one. And that was from the Cameron study. And it's also consistent with the diesel study, although the diesel study was actually more like three to one. Um, now to provide those 2000 working spaniels, you might of course have to breed 2,000 spaniels if every puppy from every litter went on to be a working dog. If only one in six puppies, say, from a litter went on to be a working dog, you would have to breed 12,000 spaniels. So if we assume there's a stable population of 10,000 of these Scottish bred dogs um, with an intake of 2,000 puppies per year, and let's say they work for five years on average before retiring, you could then multiply the above figures by five to give an approximate total instance in Scotland. So that would give you maybe 1,500 injuries needing veterinary treatment, and that might give you 300 amputations in working spaniels. Um, now, again, returning to the number of puppies bred, if we take the assumption that maybe 50% of puppies go on to be working dogs, and we have to dock the entire litter to protect those 50%. Then we might have to dock 
4,000 puppies to save 66 amputations. So there may, may be a ratio of 80 puppies to save one amputation. So these are the sort of things. Remember, that's in one year. So you have to remember that the puppies are exposed for their working life. So it's, they might be exposed year <laughs> after year for five years. And that's just to give some approximate figures which might help you. I'm not saying these are absolute, but this is to give you a general guidance of the sort of overall numbers we're talking about. Yeah, Mark, go on. I still get the sense that this is, you know, finger in the air stuff. I mean, there clearly was an opportunity when this ban was brought in place to do that 10-year cohort study looking not at general dog populations but looking specifically at working dogs, comparing the situation in England and actually coming up with robust data. Instead, we've got a survey publicised in country sports magazines. We, you know, we, we don't take that, that kind of attitude to doing surveys on wildlife crime or fox hunting. So I, I'm, just, I'm concerned about inherent biases and concerned about the lack of empirical data that's veterinary-led and I'm just curious as to why that third study wasn't completed, because I think that would give us the information that we would need to judge whether this, on animal welfare terms, is a sensible exemption or not. Well, I, I'm afraid I don't recall um, the work that was done leading up to the legislation in the first place and the regulations in the first place. Um, I, I, I think Ross Finney was the uh, minister at the time, so I, I'm... I, I can't go back and, and work out what was done in those circumstances. It was um, Ross Finney who um, did give the assurance that the position would be reviewed uh, um, if veterinary evidence became available. Um, and uh, there, after that, there became uh, uh, there was a debate, I suppose, ex post facto in terms of the legislation about this, which led subsequently to the instruction of the research um, that we are discussing. Um, uh, in order to have done the 10 year study, and I, I, I have to say I plucked that 10 years out of the air, um, I'm not 100% confident what is the actual working life of, a, of one of these dogs as opposed to when they get retired. But assuming it's somewhere between five and 10 years, which I think is probably right, um, there may be people in this room who've got a slightly better sense of what that would be than I, uh, than I have. Um, it's almost the case, I think, that Ross Finney would have required to have instructed it almost immediately. The legislation was passed, and clearly that wasn't, that wasn't in people's minds at the time of the debate. Um, but the issue has not gone away. Um, um, the extent to which puppies are now imported from south of the border, because there is a different regime south of the border, uh, is significant. Um, the, the regime south of the border is less tightly controlled uh, than what we are proposing here um, because it does permit the full docking, which is what we're not talking about here. Um, and we do think that what we are presenting here is a proportionate uh, um, move, uh, which is fairly tightly controlled um, and doesn't preclude the possibility of further future research uh, if people thought that was required, um, but is nevertheless, we think, um, an appropriate response to the concerns of those people who are actually breeding, raising and working these dogs. Content with that, Mark Roscoe? Yeah, yeah OK. Finlay Carson. <laughs> Thanks, convener. I, I do agree with much of what uh, Ms. Roscoe said with, with regards to uh, the, the sort of finger in the air with, with some of the, the research we've seen. Uh, and at the risk of being totally bamboozled by statistics again, I'm going to ask this question and, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to answer. What information do you have on the level of damage to working dog tails in the part of the UK that, uh, where there is already an exemption? Is that work that you've done so we can compare what's been happening in Scotland uh, with a regime uh, in England, Wales and Northern Ireland when the exemption exists? Um, I, I don't, off the top of my head, uh, I'm not aware of uh, a comparative um, piece of work. I do know that the regime south of the border, um, uh, the exemption is wider than, than we would allow um, and uh, the controls are a bit less tight and therefore I'm not sure how useful that comparison would be in these circumstances because you wouldn't be comparing like with like. Uh, and I'm conscious that what we're actually proposing here um, is quite narrow. Um, and, you know, we would need to see 
in terms of how, how that worked out. The breeds that are covered south of the border are wider, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Includes terriers, which we have excluded. So a comparison wouldn't be very easy to do. It, it would have given us a, a ballpark. Um, you know, again, what it's been mentioned, we've had this time from when the, the ban was brought in and we're now sitting looking at exemptions and, and there appears to be very little information. If, if we've, we've got the exemptions south of the border, we know what breeds we're talking about here, even a rough idea would have been helpful when we're making our considerations, but there doesn't appear to be that sort of information at all. But the information hasn't been collected in England. Um, the, the NISA study is the, the diesel one, and that gave an instance of 0.03% in dock dogs and 0.23% in undock dogs. So that's the best evidence that docking provides a protective effect against injuries, which some might say is you know, self-evident that if animals have had their tail removed, they're less likely to have their tail injured. But, but that's but that nobody has that covered yeah. all dogs. Yes, but that was all dogs, and that yes, that clearly was all dogs. So you would expect the effect in working dogs to be even greater. Okay. Okay. Um, Corey Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, cabinet secretary, and uh, and those with you on the panel today. Um, could you uh, tell us? Um, what assessment um, has been carried out of alternatives to tail docking to reduce tail injuries later in life? There was some, some evidence um, in the uh, evidence that we've taken as a committee prior to today about that um, in relation to the use of um, tail protectors and uh, a small amount of evidence in relation to breeding for tail carriage, although I appreciate that would take longer. <laughs> um, and uh, there, there have been... Uh, points already highlighted about um, the possibilities of appropriate kenneling, which um, my colleague Mark Ruskell has, has um, highlighted. But I wonder if there's any comment on um, alternatives to the docking. Um, well, th this, none of the studies have looked at uh, uh, alternatives in detail, uh, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, uh, the, the, I, I, I read with interest the exchanges about the potential various um, methods by which tail injury could be uh, probably not wholly prevented, but at least partially prevented. Um, and I'm not professionally in a position to make an assessment about whether or not in the context of working dogs, they are practical. Um, I can see that they, uh, they may be useful if you, you know, if, with a domestic animal who might from time to time be running out into, into wilder ground. But the, the difficulty with working dogs is that they're in that terrain all of the time. Um, and that creates, and, and often in very wet weather, and I should imagine that that creates some significant difficulties in terms of some of the proposed methods that are being, that are being uh, discussed. But I, I, I didn't really uh, um, see, again, any particularly conclusive uh, uh, lines coming out from the committee's evidence that they, they would necessarily be effective. I think they're being presented as possibilities rather than, uh, rather than anything else. And none of the research studies have actually been designed in order to look at that. I'm not sure where these other practices are in place. I, I, I don't know how you could design a study that would, would manage that. Yeah, we have considered um, evidence such as the tail protectors that are available and, and used in the United States. And these seem to be marketed as um, protective tail tips, particularly for pointer dogs. And the idea is similar to a, a 50 millimeter syringe case. It's basically a plastic covering, which is taped onto the end of the dog's tail. I have to say, uh, they seem to have fairly mixed reviews. If you look online, um, some people say that they work, others say they fall off very easily. And I think in the States, they will be mainly used for pointers rather than the, the spaniels, which will be the predominant concern in Scotland. So I could well imagine that a, a full tail spaniel with a fairly heavy protector on the end would likely be you know, at risk of maybe injuring itself or the protector would get damaged in the undergrowth anyway and, and fall off or, or pull the tail. So I, I could well believe that these aren't really practical solutions in the Scottish situation for working spaniels with full tails. 
And this this um, is, at this point, it's speculative, really, what you're saying. Yes, oh, yes. Saying? Nobody's really done any you know, you know, detailed research on the effectiveness yeah. I mean, of these um, things. We heard yeah. from Jim Dukes that uh, uh, wrapping a bandage, and I'm not disparaging this, but um, wrapping a bandage and Vaseline and, issues and, and ways of dealing with things in wet country was... Um, uh, was something that he wasn't very confident about. Uh, but if there are possible alternatives, it would seem that um, uh, it would be useful to know a bit more detail on these issues, you know, um, the kenneling and the, and the possibility of protectors, and also the hair trimming. Yeah, I mean, I would support Jim Dukes' comments about bandaging because dogs' tails are notoriously difficult to bandage, yeah. and I've had experience of practice of trying to bandage them and getting a a bandage to stay on with a dog whose tail is vigorously wagging and the dog's constantly trying to chew the bandage off or the bandage get, is getting caught in things or getting wet and muddy. So uh, yeah, I'd certainly support his view that on a practical basis, um, it's, you know, these things really aren't practical um, in Scottish situations. That particular one anyway. Yeah, yeah <laughs> particularly bandages. Yeah. Yeah, just continuing this theme about exploring possible alternatives to what's proposed, Mark Ruskell. Okay. Um, right. Um, Cameron Secretary, I think you said in your opening remarks that it was your intention that as few dogs as, as reasonably possible um, would be tail docked, who then don't go on to work. Um, so I'm wondering, I mean, if, if you agree with Tim Parkin and other witnesses that we've had in front of the committee who say that as a result of the regulations, um, there may be full litters of puppies. Um, from the relevant breeds that, that go on to be docked, regardless of whether they end up as working dogs or, or not. Would you agree with that? And, and if that is the intention of the regulations, how do, you, how do you ensure that can be prevented? Well, I mean, we confine it to the breeds in, in the first place. I uh, am fully accept that not every single puppy in every single litter will go on to become a working dog. Um, I'm not an expert uh, in this, and I don't know how... Um, dogs are identified as being likely to be good um, working dogs, but I would expect that it, between three and five days um, it would probably be a, a rather difficult assessment. I, I, I don't suppose that even the best breeder uh, can look at a three-day-old puppy and think that's the one that's going to be the champion working dog and the others will go to pets. So I expect there will be um, a, a degree of... Uh, um, uh, tail shortening uh, amongst dogs who may subsequently become uh, become pets. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we want to confine this to as few breeds as possible, um, to those breeds from whom uh, the vast majority of working dogs in Scotland are chosen, um, and from uh, those areas, particularly for vets who are actually uh, then knowing the breeders and knowing uh, uh, the... Uh, the demands of that particular uh, kind of economic activity um, to make the best assessment that they can. But we are leaving it up to their professional judgment. Would, would that then further skew the findings of the Ledger study, which focused entirely on working dogs? And actually, there's a wider population of dogs well, out there getting the tail yeah. stock, which are neither working or... or, or well, not. well, I mean, a study of actual working dogs is studying effectively adult dogs who are actually working. If we accept that not every single puppy from every single one of these um, litters the, of, the, of these working breeds um, it goes on to become uh, a, a working dog, then if they weren't working dogs, they wouldn't be included in, the, in that particular study. That particular study was looking at actual working dogs as opposed to working breeds. So, I, you, you know, I think the two things aren't the same, and we accept that, um, that we, we cannot, because you can't know until a dog is an adult that it's going to be a working dog. But, of course, if you leave it until the dog is adult, then the issues that people <coughs> are concerned about become even more critical and probably uh, more difficult to manage. Um, because if you decide... Uh, and, I, I, again, I'm not an expert, but I don't know at what age a dog can then be identified as being likely to be uh, a, a good working dog it is probably going to be over six months old. Well, shortening the dog's tail at that age is clearly going to be a bigger issue than between three and five days. 
Is there not, though, a significant loophole here, though? I'll give you an example. Somebody got in touch with me via a social media site a couple of weeks ago and said that they'd gone to England to buy a puppy with a dock tail. Now, that had come from a litter of working dogs, but it was being brought back to Scotland not to be worked, but to be kept as a pet. So is there not a significant loophole within the English legislation that could be replicated here, whereby dogs could be sold um, and moved on effectively without a, a destination as a working dog. But the loophole exists if it continues to be the situation in England, as we're describing, then, then, then we're not opening up a loophole. Um, I'm just replicating uh, it. Sorry? I'm just replicating it. Well, you know, the fact is that people are already going south of the border to get um, dogs um, with, with docked tails. So it's not as if we're, we're not creating a loophole here. Um, you know, we're, we're already um, experiencing the consequences of the difference between what is north and south of the border. Um, uh, w will some puppies with shortened tails end up as pets? Clearly, that will happen. Um, uh, um, but uh, uh, by focusing on the very specific breeds that we're talking about, and I remind you that that includes... Uh, or doesn't include terriers. Now, terriers are a huge breed um, south of the border, which can, be, uh, which can be docked. We're not including terriers. We're focusing it to as narrow a population as we think is reasonable to focus it on. Uh, it's very difficult to see how you could focus it any more narrowly, short of waiting until you've identified which dogs are actually going to be working dogs, in which case the animal welfare issues become even more difficult to manage. Just let me explore the practicalities of this, if I may, Cabinet Secretary. If some veterinary surgeons opt out of carrying out this procedure, if this proceeds, would there be an issue over meeting the requirement that judgments would be exercised by vets who have a knowledge of those presenting dogs for the procedure? And, you know, and a knowledge of the likely use those dogs will be put to. So would that process be undermined? Or would it be the view of the government that it will largely be vets who, having seen the harm done working dogs, because those are the, the dogs they see, uh, who would be carrying, asked to carry out this procedure? I haven't maybe explained that clearly enough, but I, th I think you get the thrust of what I'm getting at. I, I suspect um, most vets who are practising in rural Scotland and whose practice includes... Um, uh, uh, dogs such as this, because that's what the, 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 the local um, area requires, um, will be the ones who are most likely to accept the need for this, um, because they are the ones most likely to see the consequences of not having done it. Um, uh, I, I don't think there are so many breeders in Scotland that they won't be well known. The, the breeders of these particular t breeds will probably be pretty well known as it is uh, um, across the board. It's not as if every vet practice will have its own particular breeder uh, uh, very specific to it. Um, there, will be, uh, there will be breeders in, in broader areas. Um, might there be some vet practices who choose not to do it? Yes, clearly that may be the case. Might there be some individual vets in vet practices who choose not to do it? Yes, that might be the case, and I don't know how the practice management will handle that. Uh, I would imagine that the most likely outcome of this is that vets who are already well acquainted with all of this, who understand the issues behind this, are the ones who will be the ones carrying out the procedure, but also the ones most likely to know uh, the likely outcome of a born litter going on to become working dogs. I've written evidence in the last few days um, from veterinary practices and vets in rural settings supporting the exemption. Mm. But can I just touch on another aspect of this, however? Um, it, it, could it be that the resistance to this taking place that we've heard is out there among some vets is down, particularly amongst younger ones, to a concern about not possessing the skill set at the moment to carry out the procedure, because I think there are no vets under the age of 30, 29, 30 in Scotland who have had experience of doing this. If, if the resistance to it that we're told exists is because of that, what steps might the government take to ensure that vets were equipped 
with a skill set required and therefore had the confidence to carry out the procedure. Well, I, I, I mean, I certainly understand that for a vet who has um, uh, become a vet within the last 10 years, they will have no uh, experience of this form of tail shortening. They may have experience, of course, of dealing with tail injuries and they may have experience with requiring to uh, shorten or amputate an adult's tail, an adult dog's tail, because um, those are procedures that they may come across uh, and they may have come across. Um, uh, I, I would have thought in the first instance it would be a matter for uh, the, uh, um, the veterinary uh, bodies to to think about ensuring that there were skills. Uh, um, whether or not uh, there's a role for government to step in, I, I wouldn't like to commit myself at this point because we would need to talk to the uh, Veterinary Association about, uh, about what they thought might be necessary. Um, it would probably be most likely to be those vets, young vets who are wanting to work in rural practice that we would need to ensure that had the, had the necessary skills. Of that conversation with well, I, th I think that's right. Because, but I, I would have imagined that um, I want to say the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, but I don't suppose that's what I mean. Um, it probably be, is what you mean. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it probably is what you mean. Yeah, if, if I yeah. could comment, I mean, as a as a vet, I have doc puppies back in the late eighties when lay people were allowed to do it, and I've also um, dealt with chronic tail injuries. Now, the actual operation of docking a puppy's tail is very straightforward, and I think this has really been overplayed. Um, it, it's an, it is a very simple operation, as has been explained, and I think if a young vet is talked through it by somebody experienced who's done it previously, they won't have any difficulty in the practicality of doing this yeah, very straightforward surgery. I think we maybe could, as government, give guidance um, in talking with the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, I think it would be useful if we give guidance to veterinary surgeons explaining that if this um, legislation goes through, we're not necessarily advocating tail docking for all dogs, we're not making it compulsory, we're simply giving the vets who see the value of doing it the opportunity to exercise their professional judgment about which puppies they decide are most at risk of having injury later in life because based on their knowledge of the breeder, knowledge of where puppies from that breeder have gone previously and probably seeing tail injuries in practice, they are the ones who are in the best decision to decide, well, is it justified to dock this litter of puppies or do I feel it's not justified? Vets have a professional obligation. When we qualify, we take an oath saying our endeavour will be to protect the welfare of animals in our care. So that obligation should override all other considerations when a vet is making that decision. So if the vet genuinely believes that it's in the animal's best interest to have its tail docked, then they will be acting in accordance with the oath. If they don't believe that, then they'll be failing in their duty to actually carry out the docking. So it is something that people will take seriously. I can understand it's an ethical dilemma, but it is something that is for the profession. The profession are in a unique position to be able to make that decision. And I think they should be trusted and expected to make that. OK, thank you. Emma Harper. Thank you, convener. I'm interested in the pain management aspects of shortening the tail of a puppy versus the more invasive aspects of managing an adult that's requiring an amputation, especially following multiple engagements with a vet because of multiple repeated injuries. So um, have you... I'm just wondering, how have you interpreted the research on the pain and distress associated with... It says here docking, but I'm sh sure that shortening is a bit less invasive than actually docking a, a full tail. Um, it's about being compared to the pain and distress of an adult animal. Uh, can I just say, I, can, I, I, I looked at the evidence around that as well, and, and I... Again, without medical knowledge, I thought there was an interesting point being made that at that very early stage in a puppy's life, there's an issue about some of the pain management because the puppy's bodies are not properly developed and therefore not able to absorb some of the, um, or absorb badly some of it, some of any pain relief that might be that might be given, and uh, yeah. you know, and that that. You know, a, an adult dog can get really good drugs in terms of pain relief, but a very tiny puppy can't because of the because their organs are not in shape yet to uh, absorb that. 
um, uh, I'm just sort of yeah. kind of looking at you, <laughs> since you're the one with the actual knowledge here. Yes. Um, I think Tim Parkin mentioned that, that um, although we have local anaesthetics that might be used on very young puppies, um, many vets will say that the pain of actually giving the anaesthetic is as bad or if not worse than the very brief pain associated with the tail shortening procedure. Um, Tim was talking about analgesic drugs, so there's a very common drug that's used in veterinary practice, but it's contraindicated for animals under six weeks old, and Tim said that's because the liver isn't sufficiently developed to be able to, to cope with that analgesic, which would give longer-term pain relief. Now, the, the subject of pain in puppies, obviously, it's a very interesting area. It is difficult to assess pain in um, neonates like puppies because of their lack of behavioural responses to pain. Um, I, th I think all vets would accept that docking is, or tail shortening, is a painful procedure. So puppies certainly yelp or vocalise um, briefly when the tail shortening is done. Typically, they're then put back with the mother and they start suckling and they become calm. And some people have suggested that suckling itself it, you know, it releases endogenous opioids or endogenous painkillers. So that is a form of comfort and pain relief for the puppy in actually suckling. So there's that acute pain issue. Um, so yes, docking or tail shortening of puppies is certainly painful at the time. And that is an acute pain which will pass um, over a period. The wider concern, well, there are a couple of areas. Um, one is that an experience of acute pain as a young animal can sensitise animals to painful experiences or stressful experiences later in life. Now, we don't have any good evidence for that in dogs, and we have to say that based on the anecdotal evidence or the, the accumulated mass of experience, it isn't commonly recognised that puppies that have had their tails short and then go on to be you know, chronically nervous or chronically stressed individuals. Many people have the experience of seeing working spaniels that have had their tails docked and go on to be apparently very happy, active dogs. So we, we have to bear that in mind. The other main area is the issue of um, nerve regeneration or neuromas. Now, this is well recognised in human medicine that if you amputate a digit or a limb, the seven nerve will try to regrow, and that often forms what's called a neuroma. So that's a disorganised mass of nerve tissue that's trying to heal and granulation tissue. And that can, in human patients, um, particularly if the wound has been infected or been damaged, so that you get contraction of the wound subsequently, that can result in abnormal sensations. So there can be paresthesia, which might be pins and needles. There can be a sensation called allodynia, where previously normal sensations like touch can be perceived as painful, and there can be heightened sensitivity to pain. Now, those things are seen in maybe less than 10% of human patients who have a limb or digit amputation. So there is this concern that if you sever a nerve, you can get a neuroma. In a way, that's a, a normal response to a nerve being severed, so it's not surprising that you find these neuromas. Now, they have been found in dogs, and there's a paper from 1990 um, which describes six dogs that have had neuromas following tail docking. And the reason these were investigated was that the dogs were showing signs of being in chronic pain, so they might have been biting the tails or the tail might have been sensitive when it's handled. Now, whether the neuromas in those cases were actually causing that or whether they're just an incidental finding, um, we don't know. But the point is these were causing obvious signs in these six animals. But again, on, on the wider scale, that syndrome of a tail shortening operation causing chronic pain later in life to a dog is very unusual. So these are you know, highly unusual cases, and it's not generally recognised that spaniels that have had their tails shortened by a third will go on to have very painful tails or be constantly biting at the tails or showing signs of pain, 
which would require a further operation. Now, there is some interesting work in pigs on neuromas. I'm sorry to, to go on, but th this is quite be. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could go on if you're, if you're interested, but maybe... Uh, I, think you might be, I think you might be giving them more information <laughs> than is absolutely necessary. Well, I think we, we've got the gist of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, the proportionality of um, shortening a puppy versus the pain or the animal welfare issues with the injury of an adult tail, would the adult injury outweigh the, I guess, the puppy shortening with it at five day old? I mean, having personally done you know, both procedures, um, shortening a puppy's tail apparently seems to cause very brief pain. The puppy then suckles, gets comfort from the mother, and then there doesn't seem to be any obvious long-term effect, bearing in mind there might be this you know, concern, maybe probably a valid concern about potential chronic pain later in life. But with the tail amputation of a, an adult dog, that is certainly a very serious operation. In terms of surgery, it's relatively straightforward surgery, but usually the problems in the healing process. Quite often the tail tip swells up, stitches can come out, that there may well be infection. So that is a much more serious and potentially painful operation in an adult dog than um, a tail shortening procedure in a newborn puppy. Thank you. So, Claudia Beamish. Could I just ask you, um, uh, Andrew, whether um, there's evident, what evidence there is about um, infection um, in, in dogs after, after the docking procedure? What proportion? Um, well, is there I don't, any don't think on that? anyone has done those studies. We've heard anecdotally that, uh, I think we heard from one witness um, previously that she had seen litters that had actually died from either blood loss or infection. But that is incredibly unusual. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm not asking you the right question. I do apologise. I meant in adult dogs. Oh, adult um, dogs, who, yeah. Who haven't had their tails docked. I mean, that they might have to have an amputation. And when the amputation has happened, what proportion there might be for infection? I apologise for not being clear. Oh, right, OK. Um, I don't think anyone's gathered those statistics, but... Um, Generally, an amputation, it would probably depend on what sort of injury and what had caused the injury as to, and how long the injury had been left before it is seen by, by a vet as to how likely it is that infection would get into the wound and become established. Um, certainly with modern antibiotics, then you know, it would be routine to give antibiotics if you're doing an amputation, but there could well still be infection established before the operation takes place. But I don't think anyone's gathered that information systematically. Thank you. Uh, Alexander Burnett, I think you've got a brief question yeah. here. Th thank you very much, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I was going to ask you about whether you had a feel for the number of dogs potentially affected uh, and how many uh, Spaniel and Hunt Point retrievers are born in Scotland and how many of those went on to be working gun dogs. Uh, but I think Andrew's given a fairly comprehensive uh, extrapolation of the data that is available. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, uh, not really. Uh, um, I mean, clearly, um, as we're all aware, there are a lot of working dogs in Scotland. Um, they're working in a legitimate area of economic activity, but not all of the breeds, not all of the litters that they come from will all go on to become uh, working dogs. Um, I mean, I suppose we could try to begin to define even further how, how many specifically dogs will be affected. But I think the numbers at the moment um, can only be uh, uh, as broad as they are, um, partly because we are constantly aware that there are a lot of dogs being brought in from south of the border. And that changes the stats a bit. And that changes the, the numbers we're talking about because our estimate of the numbers of these working dogs has got to always be thought of in terms of, well, probably about a third of them are actually not dogs that were bred in Scotland any longer. They are dogs that have been brought in from elsewhere. Thank you. Um, so, so really my supplementary questions around uh, the sort of data collection, I mean, I think it's been repeated mm. uh, that, that there's a lot of uh, limitations on some of the data that's been uh, given. Um, given, you know, we have uh, microchipping, uh, there have been issues around breeding licences uh, and the ongoing monitoring of, of this legislation should it pass. Uh, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary for her views on, on future recording of statistics around dogs? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hoping across a, a, a broader range of animal welfare issues that we are going to be able to take things forward. Um, the, the statistics around dogs 
specifically for, in purpose of this. I mean, I'm not quite sure statistically how we would construct a, a, a set of stats that gave us the very particular kind of information that we're looking at uh, here or trying to look at here, but we will go away and have a, have a, have a think about that, have a think about whether or not um, there is a better way to count dogs' heads or tails um, and, uh, uh, and try and establish um, what the, the uh, what a more accurate picture is going to be. I don't think we will ever have an entirely accurate picture. Um, we know dogs are imported from all over the place, not just from south of the border. Um, and uh, um, we can see if it's possible to refine further um, some of the information that we, we've, we've got in terms of numbers. Um, and I'll let the committee know if, if we think that there is a way to, to do that. Um, there may not be, in which case I will let the committee know either way. Thank you very much. Okay, um, just to follow up Dave Stewart, and, um, the reference to microchipping brought something back to mind. I think we heard an assertion that the pain felt by a puppy might be equated to that involved in the process of microchipping. And it was also suggested that if a microchip was inserted quite close to a nerve, that could actually be quite a bit more painful. I just wonder perhaps if Andrew Voss could comment upon that evidence. Um, well, my experience in practice predates um, common microchipping, so I, I can't comment firsthand. But uh, you know, I think it's unlikely that generally um, microchipping causes significant pain. And you know, my personal opinion would be that shortening the tail of a, a puppy is going to be more painful than putting a needle in to inject a microchip. Okay. But there may well be exceptions, as, you know, as we heard. Okay. Um, David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, could I return to the types of evidence uh, that you will you'll ask vets to determine to find if uh, a dog is liable to be a working dog? But just before I ask you to, to answer that, uh, this morning, by a happy coincidence, I received an email from a working vet in my patch in the Highlands and Islands. And if I could just briefly quote Convener, uh, his comment on this. And he said, and I'm quoting, for practising vets, there's also concerns as how any amendment to legislation could be enforced. And evidence suggests that it's impossible to assess the suitability of a dog for a working role at five days old or less. I called them to Alder in 2007. And colleagues across the border have raised concerns as how the current exemption regulation in England leaves room for abuse in terms of providing, in concrete terms, the working function of the puppy. This could result in many dogs unnecessarily undergoing this painful procedure, despite the fact they will not go on to fulfil a working function in later life. How would you respond to this working vet's assessment of your planned legislation? Well, um, I've already conceded that at three to five days old, it's probably almost impossible to identify which puppy in a litter uh, or which puppies in a litter are going to be effective working dogs in their adult lives. Um, uh, but I've uh, indicated, of course, that uh, um, you can't wait until they're mature, uh, or you could be, be detailed shortening when they're a lot older, but I presume that's a much more traumatic experience if a puppy's six to, six to nine months old when you do that, as opposed to three to five days old. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I, what we are proposing um, does not mean that only puppies who then become to go on working dogs uh, will have their tails shortened. Um, that's why we've talked about breeds um, rather, than, uh, uh, rather than working dogs per se, but it's also why um, we want to leave that to veterinary judgment. Um, uh, I can't speak in regards to the individual vet there. That may be a vet who makes a decision that he's not going to do that, he or she's not going to do this. Um, uh, which will be something that they're perfectly entitled to do. Um, but what we, what we have said is uh, that vets will be looking at uh, the history of the breeder um, that they're, they're dealing with. They'll be looking at the, um, the, uh, the people that are bringing the dog, um, the, 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 the gamekeepers, uh, those with shooting licenses, those who are actively involved in hunting, um, if, if somebody rocks up from a suburb in Aberdeen with a dog that it wants its tail shortened, I could imagine that, you know, a vet may be somewhat sceptical as to the likelihood that that's going to go on to be a working dog. Um, but dogs that are brought in by either recognised breeders or by those who are actively involved already uh, in the activities that involve working dogs, 
um, will, will be viewed differently by vets. Um, and it will be a matter for individual vets in individual circumstances um, to make these decisions. Um, I'll send on the email to you and I certainly you. welcome your, your comments because I appreciate you can't necessarily answer this cold. Um, could just ask then my final questions about enforcement. You mentioned the Aberdeen example. Let's just take a hypothetical situation in the future that you get evidence that vets are not checking that the animal is likely to be involved with uh, used for work in connection with the lawful shooting of animals. Who would then be the inspector of this? Would it be the Vets Professional Association? Would it be some new organisation that you're setting up? I mean, who's going to inspect it? Because the old story is um, that we need to check who's guarding the guards in any legislation, don't we? I mean, what's your, what's your inspection going regime going to be? To anticipate setting up a specific body of inspectors to deal with this particular issue. We, we, we don't do that with GPs or any other clinical kind of thing, so I didn't suppose we'd be doing it for vets in respect of this. Um, I mean, we are relying on veterinary and surgeons to have a proper professional attitude towards this. Um, uh, and, you know, if there was uh, repeated reporting of, if you like, a rogue practice or a rogue vet out there, then it would be a matter for the professional body to deal with um, rather than government. Obviously, just, just for the record, clearly, uh, along with the Cabinet Secretary, I understand we have a very professional group of vets across Scotland and uh, I wouldn't expect it to be an issue, but any legislation requires teeth as well. So there's not going to be any new body you would require the professional association of vets to take any enforcement action if vets were breaching the, this legislation? I, I would expect it would be a professional matter for the Veterinary Association um, if, if it felt that vets were, uh, uh, were doing unnecessary uh, tail shortening on, mm. on... And let's be honest, it would have to be on breeds that weren't working yeah, sure. breeds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, that would become, that would become yeah, something yeah. of an issue. It would obviously it would also be a technical offence under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006, which can be enforced by SSPCA inspectors or by a local authority. So that would be a technical offence. But as we've heard, almost certainly the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons would want to take action if they had so, cases reported to them that vets were sure. docking otherwise in accordance with the legislation. So could you remind the committee um, what the sanctions are under that legislation if there's a breach of that? previous legislation. You maybe refer to a lawyer. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm just making sure that Judith Brian Orange are current today since she's been set so quiet. Uh, yes, it, if, the, if, the, uh, if the procedure did not accord with the terms of the proposed exemption, it would amount to the offence of mutilation under section 20 of the 2006 Act. Um, so that would, that would be a criminal offence. And I can uh, check exactly what the level of penalty would be. And just when you're looking up to, um, after my unfair comment there, um, I take it that the SSPCA and, um, uh, still, would still have a role as they have in general animal welfare when it comes to this, this legislation. So, for example, if an irate constituent in Highlands and Islands um, referred uh, a case of a vet not looking into whether an animal is likely to use for work in connection with lawful shooting of animals, they could refer that to SSPCA who could look at the 2006 legislation in terms of any potential breach. Is that my correct right. understanding of the law? Yes, that's correct. Yep. Good. Yes, so uh, the penalties for offences, for an offence under Section 20, a person who commits an offence under Section 20 is liable in summary conviction to imprisonment for a term not exceeding 12 months or a fine not exceeding £20,000 or both. So potentially then... The, um, if it was a vet, could be subject to professional misconduct under the Professional Association of Vets and any criminal action under the 2006 legislation. Yes, that's correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Richard Lyle. Yeah. The Cabinet Secretary. Well, Judith Brown is looking up Section 20. Can you confirm to me um, that uh, under the Act, it's also an offence to take a protected animal from Scotland to a different, different uh, uh, regime for the purpose of having its tail docked in another country. So we've had a discussion about people in Scotland that are taking animals down to the puppies to, down to... Bed. I, I talked about people going south no, to I buy animals did, to bring them in. I didn't say you said it. Uh, it's been discussed uh, uh, previously that people take their animals to England to get them tail docked. Uh, if they do, are they breaking the law? Well, in the context of that, it sounds very much like it. Yes, yes, I, yeah. that's good okay, that, to take them. I, did, I didn't apologise yes. apology if you think I was meaning you, I wasn't. Yeah, um, no, five, maybe. Yeah. 
people going south to buy dogs and bring them back, as opposed to taking well, their we, own dogs. Well, we were talking previously that people have to actually physically take them from Scotland to England well, to get the other them thing to happened is that people might take the pregnant bitch into England to give birth, and then they can legally have the puppies docked in England. So that is a practice that we've yeah. anecdotally okay. we've heard is going I just, on. I just wanted yeah. clarification. I don't yeah. want to make a big issue no, no. out of okay. it. Right. Well, she may have covered my, my next question in your opening statement. The committee last week were told that a combination of breeds element and the regulation could provide a huge loophole. What is your response to this? Well, we have narrowed uh, down as far as we think is reasonably practicable. Um, I am not quite sure what loophole is being discussed uh, in respect of that. As I said, south of the border, terriers are included in the exemption, and we have deliberately um, uh, excluded terriers from the situation in Scotland. Um, and uh, I think there was, was there some conversation about mixed breeds, but the, the mixed breeds would be within the, the um, Hunt Point Retriever and Spaniel uh, um, general breeds, um, rather than um, being bred from outside those two, uh, uh, those two breeds. So um, uh, we, we think we have got that down as far as we can in terms of, uh, of, actual, uh, of actual breeds. Um, and I'm not clear, other than the loophole about there might be some dogs that end up as pets having their tails shortened, um, uh, other than that, I'm not quite sure what the loophole would be. Okay. How would uh, you think vets would be certain that the breed they are presenting for, they are, they are being presented with for docking is covered by the regulation? I would seriously, seriously, genuinely hope that a vet does can tell the even I can tell when a spaniel's in front of me. <laughs> have to be has to be said. I'm not sure I'm quite so confident on hunt point retrievers, but uh, um, I would definitely know a spaniel when I saw it, and I would assume a vet did as well. I would hope a vet did as well. I'm sure we would. <laughs> I would I'd defer to my yeah, yeah. veterinary colleague here. But I, again, I'm I think that's think a, it would be a matter of professionalism, and if you're presented with some weird cross and you weren't sure if it's a pointer or not, then you shouldn't be docking it because, you know, that would be your professional duty would be to... But, but to again, is it not the fact that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I used to have a Yorkshire Terrier, um, but, you know, different breeds and breeders are, are, are cross-breeding, you know, so is there any scope for any dubiety? I, I know what a spaniel is. Yeah, but, I think if there was any scope for energy then a professional vet would be asking questions about the, um, uh, the ancestry of the dog. And if they didn't get reasonable answers, then uh, clearly the situation is such that they would have to say no. Um, yes, I accept that there are lots of crossbreeds appearing, uh, although vets are becoming quite familiar with the, the more uh, popular crossbreeds that we've identified just a few moments ago, you would be quite confident, I presume, that they were <laughs> taking every care in this matter. Um, if members have completed the questions that they wish to ask, I propose that we move to agenda item four, which is consideration of motion S5M05754, that the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the prohibited procedures on protected animals, exemptions, Scotland, amendment regulations, 2017, draft be approved. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak and move the motion. I should say to members that procedurally this section can last up to 90 minutes and that it should be noted that government officials cannot take part in this uh, part of the meeting. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. I refer to the comments I've already made, uh, Convener, and I move that the draft prohibited procedures on protected animals, exemptions, Scotland, amendment regulations 2017 be approved. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I would now invite members uh, to make any contribution they wish to make. Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I dealt with the Animal Health and Welfare Bill in the second session of this Parliament, and the issue of tail docking and the issue of potential exemptions for working dogs was given very thorough scrutiny at that point. Um, and we didn't agree to that, and Parliament didn't agree to an exemption. And that was on the basis of the veterinary evidence that was presented to us. And I don't feel anything's changed. Um, I, I'm not being presented a robust scientific case for bringing in this exemption at this point. Um, I believe what we've had in front of us has been 
deeply unscientific. It consists of one study that was a self-selecting study through the pages of country sports magazines. We have another study that's based on a wider population of dogs, doesn't distinguish working dogs. We have a third study which wasn't even commissioned and didn't even take place. And this is 10 years after the exemption, sorry, after tail docking was banned in Scotland. So we just don't have the scientific evidence on this from an animal welfare point of view, uh, to, I believe, to allow this uh, to pass. Um, none of the studies have looked at the wider causes of tail injuries. They haven't looked at kenneling. None of the studies have looked at the wider potential behavioral impacts of removing tails from puppies. So again, we've got nothing to compare the costs and benefits. And I think as a result, if you look at every single veterinary body in this country, not a single one is backing this legislation, this change, this exemption. And you have to ask the question why that is. In England, exemptions were brought in, but they're full of loopholes. And essentially, the Scottish Government wants to mirror that situation here. It wants to weaken the progressive legislation that we passed in session to, to match the unworkable exemptions that exist in England and Wales. I don't think it stacks up, and I think the evidence, yet more evidence, you know, guesstimates that we've heard today about the number of puppies' tails that would have to be docked under five days old to prevent a, a tail amputation in, in a working dog, it just doesn't stack up. 80 to 1. Um, I don't believe that the pain and the injury that's inflicted in a puppy at that age is 80 times less than uh, an injury which causes an amputation in an adult dog. So I think for all those reasons, I can't see a robust scientific way to actually back this uh, proposed subordinate legislation. I'll certainly be voting against it. Okay. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, convener. I'm Cabinet Secretary. I'll also be voting against uh, this um, exemption uh, regulation today. Um, in my view, some of the research um, hasn't been done that needed to be done over a 10-year period. Um, some of it isn't clear, and, and some parts of it are, in my view, too speculative um, in some areas for me to be able to support the amendment. I highlight um, the issue of there being no research into kenneling and into um, alternatives, no actual scientific research into the alternatives uh, to docking. Um, although we've heard from Andrew Vaz uh, today um, on some of that aspect of it. Um, also, in my view, um, Andrew Vaz's evidence um, had some maybes in it in relation to the numbers of spaniels, and there were some extrapolations which um, uh, to receive um, some, some evidence from one study and then link it to another study made it, uh, in my view, quite um, uh, unclear and uncertain. Um, so, uh, there are also concerns that I have about the impact on behaviour and communication um, uh, after, the, after the docking, uh, because as we know, or as I know anyway, and this is just purely from my own perspective, um, that a dog's tail tells us a lot, and we don't know, there isn't, again, um, research into this, I don't know how that research indeed could be done. Difficulties of assessing pain in puppies is also a big question mark, and so I have to say today that um, in terms of animal welfare, um, I'm not convinced by the evidence to committee that the docking is a proportionate response um, and that there is enough research um, as, as, we, as we stand today, so I will have to vote against this. Okay. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Um, as well as the written evidence and oral evidence, I've also looked into this a little bit as well, and I've spoke to vets directly and you know as someone who has participated in amputation of limbs and humans I think there is a proportional response to avoid future injury by allowing the docking of puppies tails um, I think it would seem uh, appropriate to allow the vets in rural practices who know the breeders and know the people involved in uh, the working dog businesses that they will be quite um, I guess appropriate as the people who will make the determination as to what will be appropriate. My additional concern was about hunt point retrievers are quite a big breed but I found out at last time we took evidence that the the HPRs are not just hunters or pointers or retrievers 
they are becoming more mixed in the skill required for those dogs. So that would make it seem appropriate to include the hunt point retriever breeds. But again, if it was a pointer that uh, was proposed to have its tail docked, um, those dogs, according to their breed, their carriage of their tail is horizontal, so it doesn't go into undergrowth. So I think uh, I would be quite um, supportive in allowing the professional vets to um, you know, help support this. Okay. Uh, Finlay Carson. Thanks, convener. Uh, I'm somewhat disappointed with the, the, the lack of joined up uh, evidence that the committee has received, uh, given the, the time that's been available to, to, to gather information and that there's already an exemption present uh, in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. However, on balance, I believe that uh, the preventative measure of tail shortening uh, to reduce the, uh, the widely accepted uh, extreme pain that uh, tail damage can cause in later life uh, I'm, I'm supportive of the, the government's motion. Kate Forbes. Thanks very much. Um, I, to start with the position that we have a problem of um, future pain in adult working dogs and um, there is tail damage and the question is what we do about that. I, I would echo Mark's point about being disappointed with evidence, but on both sides, I think that in um, the last 10 years, there has been opportunities for both sides to, to make a case. Um, and there, you know, I was really, really disappointed two weeks ago in asking those um, who were uh, against tail docking about alternative solutions in light of the fact that there is um, future damage in adult working dogs and there weren't those um, solutions in place. So from an animal welfare point of view, for me it comes down to um, pain as a puppy versus pain as an adult. And um, with it happening to an extent in England already, I think there are loopholes that are being used at the moment. And it would be far better to have a more proportional response to target a more limited population in Scotland. Um, and, then, and then just lastly, um, finishing off with the point that um, it, whilst evidence is, is critical in this, having spoken at length just anecdotally within my constituency I recognise there is a problem with adult working dogs and at the moment we do not have a, um, a solution to that pain. Do any other members wish to say anything? Angus MacDonald. <coughs> yeah, thanks convener. I think the, the, the salient point in all of this is um, if, if tail shortening is to, to, to go ahead uh, these animals would be up to 20 times less likely to suffer uh, prolonged injury in, in later life, as, as we've heard on, on numerous occasions. And a, another salient point for me is in the, the Lederer study, which tells us that uh, over one in two spaniels and over one in three hunt point retrievers uh, with full length tail, um, f with full length tails, sustained one or more injuries in one season. So I believe the the case has been made by the government, and I'll be supporting the legislation. Okay. Do any other members wish to contribute? Okay, from my perspective, I, I see this as a preventative move aimed at avoiding significant painful experiences in later life, and it's targeted at those dogs that are at risk. Uh, I understand the concerns of some animal welfare organisations, and indeed some colleagues, but on the other hand, this ignores the queer harm that's being done to working dogs. Uh, and are we saying that we know there's an issue there, but so be it? Um, like Kate Forbes, I, I must admit the evidence that we got in person the other week uh, to the committee uh, from both sides of the argument was not persuasive in either direction. But the subsequent written submission from the Scottish Gamekeepers Association, which was backed by a variety and a sizable number of knowledgeable rural vets, convinces me, although I do feel that, as we've touched on earlier, there is a need, if this is passed, for some work to be done to ensure that vets have a clear understanding of the exemption and are uh, competent and possess the skill set required uh, um, for this practice to be carried out. So I too will be supporting this. Does any other member wish to make a contribution? No? In that case, I invite the Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Uh, I, I don't think there's really anything that I want to uh, add to what's already been um, before us, just to 
um, remind everybody um, that we've deliberately used the language of tail shortening because this is not a return to tail docking, even in the very limited circumstances that we are proposing the exemption. Um, uh, removal of one third of the tail still leaves an expressive tail. Um, and uh, I, I believe that some of the concerns, as much as I understand the emotional response to it, um, are, are, are that very emotional. Um, and the problem is that we have uh, an issue amongst us, a relatively small population in comparison to total dogs in Scotland um, who are being used for very particular working uh, experience and need better protection than they're getting at the moment. Thank you. I therefore put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S5M 05754, sorry, in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Uh, so can I ask members who are in favour to raise their hands? Okay. Those who are against? Any abstentions? There are no abstentions. Uh, so the result is seven votes in favour, three votes against and no abstentions. Um, the committee's report will confirm the outcome of the debate. Can I ask if members are content to delegate the signing off of the report to the convener? You are indeed. Thank you. So the motion has been agreed to. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, thank you for the time of you and your officials. Um, at its next meeting on the 20th of June, the committee will hold an evidence session with stakeholders to explore waste generation and disposal in Scotland and will also consider subordinate legislation on the environmental impact assessment Miscellaneous Amendments, Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017-168. The meeting is now finished. Thank you.